Harry Smith, company commander, now knows that he's got no chance. There is no way that he can force the issue. First of all, this is 420. He then uh, uh, asks Bravo Company to return. Remember, we sent Bravo back and they stopped. Well, we, we, we stopped them at the first contact. Uh, please, uh, please let them return because that's another 30, uh, 40, 30 or 40 men. Commanding a CO uh, of Six Rar tells him uh, to wait. We can't, uh, we can't authorize the return. He then says, well, if you, if you can't give me Bravo back again, then how about you put another company on, uh, APCs, and, and uh, send them out, or better still, choppers, because it was still clear. Uh, and the, the choppers could have landed um, uh, anywhere uh, on the side, on the road. We could have uh, cut down trees if necessary. Um, but no choppers available, so we can't get reinforcements. OK, well, put your standby company on APCs and get them out here. Oh, we've got none, we've got no standby company uh, against us. VC at this stage, or the NVA, have now pinpointed where 11 is because they've been doing their probing attacks and they're starting to assault 11. The artillery uh, in support of 11 is getting closer and closer. It's now still about uh, 250 yards out, but it's getting closer and, it's, and we don't know it, but it's taking a toll on people in reserve. Advisors uh, comes back and, and says, well, the APCs and the standby company are, are the uh, task force uh, commander's option. And so the colonel has to ask the brigadier if he can have them. The brigadier is coming back and saying, well, yeah, I'll, I'll see if what I can do. You know, stand by, wait. Um, the, the firefight, as it develops here, uh, gets very up close and personal because the enemy um, doesn't know the size of, of, the, of the 10 platoon. So they're thinking, well, maybe there's only a few people, so they're, they're, uh, they're starting little assaults, which are being beaten off. Uh, I mentioned the weather hasn't, hasn't broken yet, but it's, uh, it's now full cloud cover, no sunlight coming through, uh, so it's very deep and gloomy under, under here. That's where um, Private A. Kell had to come with his spare radio set. Uh, and I, I said he's out that way, you know, 20, 30 row, uh, tree rows, and that's about what we've done. He uh, uh, reports that he, he met uh, two enemy uh, on his way in, which indicates that the VC were sending deep, deep um, uh, probes around. And as they pull back, they realize that they're getting a platoon here and a platoon and a platoon. They, they start realizing that it's more than a platoon, which adds to Harry's, uh, Harry Smith's uh, burdens, because now we know that... Uh, and Similar things happening in uh, 11 platoon. We know that we're up against more than twice the force that we have in the field. The next section would go back two tree rows. The third section would be helping the wounded back. Once the second section was uh, in place, then they would call the first section. The first section would go back two rows behind up, and it would be a, a stepped stage withdrawal. And that's what he's what he's going to do now. He can't help 11, so. 11 is, uh, is, is still on their own, and they're, they're still taking casualties because they're still receiving um, large uh, assaults. 11 platoon still in very heavy contact. 11 platoon's radio gets, uh, um, uh, gets the aerial shot up. Um, and that's no damage to the radio, but it means that you can't transmit or receive. So effectively, they're out of comms. At that point, um, just, uh, just before it went out, um, Gordon Sharp, directing artillery, put his head up and got shot through the neck and killed instantly. Buick took over straight away, so now Buick is the new platoon commander. He rings up and he says, uh, Sunray down, uh, and comms is off. So we're left there with a Sunray down, which, which basically Sunray is the commander, down is, uh, is KIA. Um, and uh, um, uh, Buick in, in, uh, in need of redirecting artillery, of, of dropping artillery. And we know that he's dropping artillery because he's been doing that for, uh, for some minutes beforehand. But we're now expecting, because 10 is coming back, that now uh, 10, CHQ and 12 will all, as a group, go towards 11. That's what we're thinking, because that's, that's the only option we have bring everyone together and let's all move forward uh, 
and if we meet enemy, we meet enemy, but we've still got to do something about 11 to 2. Artillery is falling uh, in support of both 10 and 11, as close as the, uh, as the radio comms have permitted it so far. At this point, and, and they're on their way back, um, it starts to rain. And when it starts to rain, it's like you're in the shower and it's all dark and, uh, and, and gloomy and you just turn on the tap and the shower just comes straight on, full blast. It, there was no sort of little drips and drops and, um, and building up and it's now a little shower and isn't that cute and now it's light rain and now it's heavy rain. This is just a drench. And anyone that's been here and uh, come four o'clock, oh yeah, poof, I can't see my watch. That's the way it was. And in this particular day, it was thunder and lightning and so on as well. Five o'clock. It didn't take long for, ten, uh, for 11 platoon to replace the, uh, the shot off aerial. So they replaced the shot off aerial. They get back on the uh, uh, comms. They adjust their artillery. Their artillery is now um, falling uh, very much closer. At the five o'clock mark, we recognize that we want more artillery because now as, as, uh, as 10 is coming back and the enemy is following them, now CHQ wants its own artillery. So we now ask for regimental artillery. We ask for all guns at base to be firing in support of us. And that is denied. When the rain started, it was halved. We could see 100 yards. Uh, we're virtually blind until the artillery starts firing within the visual distance. So if you can see 100 yards and the artillery is firing at 50 yards, then the, the artillery forms a, a, a steam screen and you can see the enemy is either behind it and coming through or is in front of it and you can silhouette it against it. We were super cautious and we were crawling at this point. And we get to the stage where there's we're, we're finding too many people. Um, by the time we fire at someone at one place, we see people at another place. So we, we're, we figure, I figure, that we've gone as far as we can go. Um, and if we go any further, the people that we see coming around the edges of 11 will start coming around us as well. So I decide, well, this is the, the only place I can, I can, all I can do now is stop here and stop those people from closing the circle. CHQ then says, uh, well, we're running out of ammunition, we'll request an ammunition resupply. At the same time, we know where the enemy is now, and we know where we aren't. For instance, on the foot end, foot end of the hill, um, if we can't get more artillery, which we, we can't get because we don't have, we'll call in an airstrike. And so uh, the standard operating procedures during the war was that the Americans kept patrols of phantom jets overhead all the time. There was always jets circling over the head. When they started to run out of fuel, a new uh, group would come up, that flight would land, refuel and go up again. There was always a standing patrol over, over most provinces. And all we had to do was say, uh, give them a target and they'd call the two or three nearest flights. Now 10 minutes has passed, all of this battle is still happening. We're taking casualties and we're inflicting casualties. It's now 6 p.m. This is where the red smoke uh, uh, incident happened. Uh, they were overhead, they said throw smoke. Red was thrown, they identified orange. We said no, they flew around, uh, throw red. Uh, I see red drop ammo. So ammo is happening now, uh, resupply over at CHQ where we were. Um, I knew about it, but uh, I wasn't able to take advantage. So we're still under strict fire control orders here. Uh, 11 platoon is now untenable. So Buick picks up what he can and, uh, and comes back. Now, um, uh, there's a lot of unfortunate stories about this uh, particular withdrawal. Uh, and as my understanding is, the, un uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, they tried to identify anyone that was dead and anyone that was living. Uh, but in the circumstances, they couldn't go and take pulses on everybody. Uh, so anyone that was unconscious and living, uh, and there were two, but as it turned out the next day, they were left there. But everyone else who was wounded was evacuated. And I think that was a bloody incredible achievement under the circumstances, although the people that were left out don't necessarily think that way. So Buick now, uh, from the white um, from the white cross, is is moving back in this general direction. Step ahead again, uh, ten minutes. Now it's 6:20. Uh, ten is still fighting over at CHQ. Mm -hmm. 
Um, 11 has now reached my position here. And um, my medic is now looking after the 11 platoon wounded as best as he can. Unbeknownst to me, a mortar bomb has landed in between the ankles of my, my platoon sergeant. Uh, and has ruined his, uh, his day. His ankles are both, uh, are, are both uh, full of shrapnel. My medic can't find any, uh, any issue with it. He can't find any open wound. Um, uh, there's, there's red mud everywhere and you can't see the blood against the mud. Uh, so he says, um, you know, you're concussed, I'll look after someone else. Paddy Todd is his name. Paddy knows that we've come down in a dog leg. So being an old soldier, he knows that all he has to do is reverse the process and he'll get back home tells the man in front of him, tell the boss I'm going, and he go, He starts crawling this way, he can't walk. So he's off now on his own, and I don't know. The bloke that got the message gets wounded, so I never get the message. 6.20, everything's going fine, no, we're, we're, all, all that I'm talking about is still happening, and the APCs get to the uh, river, and they're told to come back to task force base because the battalion commander wants to get aboard. The APC commander, Adrian, Adrian Roberts, a, a, a mere lieutenant, uh, arguing with a, a lieutenant colonel, says, no, I can't do that, um, I've got a mission to do, I'll send two APCs back, I will leave one at the crossing, and, uh, and with the rest of the other seven I will proceed. So that, and uh, it, was, it was dead quiet um, uh, for, for a little while, and that gave me the signal, okay guys, um, <laughs> pick up your goodies and go. And so we raced off again straight back to CHQ. The only person unaccounted for was this sergeant. He had gone off this way, back to the hut, and started crawling this way. And he was obviously crawling northwards when these people were coming up behind him southwards. If he had turned around and seen them coming, he would have jumped up and run. He <laughs> was <laughs> two broken ankles. But he didn't. Uh, mind you, he's just a lump of mud moving very slowly through the plantation, so you know, no one's going to see him. And it wasn't until we all got back to base and someone said, well, where's Sergeant Todd? And uh, everyone looked around and well, nobody knows. And uh, a, a couple of minutes after that, uh, um, he turned up in front of 10 platoons. To, um, and after Todd got, got back to base, then we were, all that we know of, were in the CHQ area, uh, leaving 15 guys uh, out there, 13 of whom we now know were dead and two were, which, who were wounded. That all happened around about the 6.30 mark. And, and it happened very quickly, probably as quickly as it took to, to, to describe it.